Hi there, everyone. My name is Pirak Juthani. I'm a second year resident in internal medicine at Stanford. And today I want to go into cardiology, specifically with a focus on ACS, aka acute coronary syndrome. This is part of my intern 101 series that is pretty much a video based series on a lot of the intangible and tangible skills that you need to learn during intern year, some of which are going to be based on content like this one, and others of which are based on workflow and learning just how to cover the broad amount of stuff that you need to be able to do as an intern, which I am still learning, um, but just sometimes teaching can be helpful. Today, we will be focusing on ACS within cardiology. I'm going to define ACS. I will then go over the way to generally manage ACS from an internal medicine standpoint, and I will also go over general like doses of medications. Obviously, none of this is medical advice, and none of this is also something that you should blatantly copy. It's just a way to show you the small nuances of what it means to be an intern. You not only need to know the like how, what the next steps are, but you need to know the diagnoses, and you need to know the medications they need to give and what order. Um, a lot of the information today will be coming from this article right here from Bob Harrington, Dr. Harrington, who used to be the chair of Stanford's internal medicine or just chair of Stanford medicine in general, and then um, Dr. Deepak Bhatt, who's at, um, I believe, um, uh, Harvard, um, and as well as some trials that are you can also find on Wiki Journal Club. Um, and so we'll kind of go from there. So cardiology is huge, and so I'm not going to obviously go into cardiology 101 holistically. There's so many small nuances of cardiology that we deal with when you are in internal medicine. Uh, but more broadly, cardiology today is going to be on ACS. And ACS is acute coronary syndrome, which encompasses unstable angina, uh, non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, as well as ST elevation myocardial infarction. Those three things usually, usually present with chest pain. However, chest pain is very broad, and I don't want to anchor that just because someone has chest pain, it's usually cardiac. In this video, we will be talking about cardiac chest pain, but just know that if someone comes in with chest pain, it's a very broad diagnosis, and you should be considering several other etiologies, including but not limited to peptic ulcer disease from a GI standpoint, uh, GERD, esophageal spasm, Burhoff syndrome. Uh, if someone's been vomiting recently, there could be MSK-related etiologies such as costochondritis, which you can see here. There can also be pulmonary etiologies such as pneumonia, pneumothorax, asthma, upper airway cough syndrome, uh, and then you can also have psychiatric conditions such as panic attacks, right? Today, we're going to focus entirely on uh, cardiac causes, um, and even within cardiac, notice that there can be pulmonary emboli or dissections like aortic dissections, which can also present with chest pain, usually those individuals will have some level of hypertension as opposed to hypotension, but just know that those are some of the things that I'm always thinking of when someone gets uh, chest pain. So today we're going to talk about acute coronary syndrome. As I said, there's three big buckets, um, unstable angina, non-ST elevation MI, and ST elevation MI. Uh, within, uh, within ACS, 30% of all ACS is usually ST elevation a myocardial infarction. What that means is on EKG, you will see ST elevations. Usually you need one or two contiguous leads with more than one or two uh, millimeter elevations. And then um, the rest is actually 70%. Um, the non-ST elevation myocardial infarction as well as unstable angina account for the 70% of ACS. <clears throat> so how do you differentiate between them? Almost all of them will have some component of chest pain. Uh, if they don't have chest pain, usually it's very tough to diagnose true acute coronary syndrome because then it's like, what are you making the diagnosis off of? Once you have the chest pain, then the next step is to check for biomarkers, specifically troponin. There's new high sense, hence high sensitivity troponin. Usually when the troponin is elevated, that suggests that there's some level of cardiac stress. That stress can be true cardiac damage, which is known as a type, type 1 uh, stress. Um, there can also be a type 2 stress on the heart, which is if someone is, for example, septic, your heart's going to be bu beating a lot faster, and that's called a type 2 stress, and there can cause a supply-demand mismatch within the heart, which can also lead to an elevated troponin. So angina, uh, unstable angina is on one side of the spectrum, and then you'll see that as things progress, you can get a non-ST elevation MI and an ST elevation MI. Stable angina is when you have a uh, pain with exertion, and specifically, angina and substernal chest pain that usually is at least 10 minutes, if not longer. And then you can have unstable angina, which is chest pain at rest. 
and then non-ST elevation MI, which means the same symptoms as unstable angina, but now you have an elevated troponin marker, right? So unstable angina does not usually have elevated troponin markers, but non-ST elevation MIs do have elevated troponin markers. Interestingly though, with high sensitivity troponins, this entire category of unstable angina is almost going away now because anyone with some chest pain at rest usually will have an elevated high sensitivity troponin. That's the whole point of it being highly sensitive. It's gonna be very high, even for the smallest things related to your cardiac health. And then obviously true um, ST elevation MI is gonna be elevated troponins for sure. And then you'll have um, ST elevations on EKG. So um, the underlying pathophysiology of acute coronary syndrome is a sudden reduction in the blood supply to the heart, whether that's due to an acute plaque rupture or just plaques building up over time to the point where a lot of blood flow is limited. There are multiple trials. The first one I want to talk about is the tacit TIMI trial, which talks specifically about patients with unstable angina or non-ST elevation MI. And it basically asks for pe patients who come in with unstable angina or non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, does an early invasive approach actually help them? And what I mean by early invasive approach is if someone comes in with an ST elevation MI, the first thing you're gonna do is cath them. In patients with unstable angina and non-ST elevation MI, the question in this trial was, do, does cathing these patients also help? And the question was, yes. Um, and specifically, the benefit is most apparent if you cath individuals who present with ST segment changes, troponin elevation at presentation, or patients with elevated TIMI scores. And I'm going to go over the TIMI score, but you should definitely be calculating a TIMI score for anyone that you think is coming in with cardiac chest pain, because that can really help risk stratify um, how urgently you want to consider cathing them. Um, what is the TIMI score, you might be asking? So the TIMI score is a score that you can usually go to MD-Calc and just fill in. Um, usually it asks you their age, it asks you their risk factors, and it'll spit out a score. So notice that the score um, is just a numerical value. But if you have a score between zero to two, that suggests a very low risk of underlying cardiac health uh, issues. And a higher score indicates that you might have true um, underlying cardiac disease that might benefit from early cath um, early cath, usually that within 24 hours. So unlike an ST elevation MI, which you would cath urgently, um, with an unstable angina or a non-ST elevation MI, you usually want to cath between 24 to 30 hours. Um, so do this score, and if it's elevated, you can see that if it's above two or three points, you usually do want to cath according to the tacit TIMI trial, and specifically, especially if they have elevated troponins at baseline, you usually want to cath them. So this is kind of taken from that paper that we started this entire video with, which is when do you um, end up needing to cath people and how do you even work individuals up? So usually the first thing you do, someone comes in with chest pain, you obviously should be thinking ACS, you get an EKG, you get a troponin. You also obviously want to get like a BNP, you want to get a creatinine. There's a lot of other things you might get just to very, have a very thorough diagnosis workup. But let's say now you're worried about true... Uh, ACS. In a non-ST elevation change, you usually want to decide if it's unstable angina or NSTEMI. If unstable angina, that usually implies that the troponin was not elevated, and you usually need to continue to trend the troponin and make sure it does not proceed to elevate. If the troponin is elevated at baseline, then you have a true NSTEMI, and you usually do want to go ahead and do a cath within 24 hours. If there is, a, um, is, there is an obstruction, you then want to open it up. If there's obstruction in more than three vessels, you want to consider obviously a um, um, bypass surgery, but usually if it's one or two vessel territory, you can just go ahead and open it up pretty quickly. Uh, same with an ST elevation, you just go ahead and obviously open that up way, way faster within like two hours, whereas in, uh, in an NSTEMI, you can probably wait around like 24-ish hours. Um, same with unstable angina. If you start realizing unstable angina is slowly getting elevated troponins and they're starting to go upwards, you're going to need to consider cathing them. Um, so now that kind of brings us into a patient comes in, I think they have ACS. What are the things that I acutely usually do in the ED? When uh, someone truly has ACS and I'm worried about it and it's not a true ST elevation, the first thing I'll do is aspirin load them. You want to give them 325 of aspirin, which is usually four pills. And then you usually want to continue an 81 milligram aspirin there, there afterwards. This is the whole point of an aspirin load. You're giving a bunch at once to kind of get the blood levels to peak earlier. Then you want to do a P2Y12 load. You can usually do a Plavix load. You can do a Ticagra load. At Stanford, we usually do a Plavix load. So we do 600 milligrams once and then 75 milligrams afterwards. And specifically, we do 600 milligrams if we know that they're considering getting cath. 
and then start a heparin drip because obviously this is a uh, plaque that we think is causing some level of obstruction. So you need to anticoagulate them. And then usually start a high dose statin, usually rosuvastatin, or aka Crestor, or you can do a torvastatin. So you can do a torvastatin 40 or 80 or rosuvastatin 20 or 40. Um, I have a very interesting short on um, the statin dosings that I can link as well. Uh, and then usually I give oxygen, morphine, and nitrates. But for nitrates, just make sure you know that you're, don't, you're not thinking about a right-sided infarct or RCA infarct because that is very preload dependent. Um, and lastly, uh, notice that the reasons why we do a lot of these things is based on um, trials. So you can see the Prove It Timmy trial, t Prove It Timmy 22 trial, which shows that high dose statins are very helpful for people who are um, obviously uh, ACS. And then other things that you're going to want to do that you may not. Uh, end up cathing. Let's say you figure out that someone is maybe has ACS, but then you realize the troponin is downtrend. You may still want to get a TTE, a transthoracic echocardiogram, and you also may want to consider getting a stress test because that's for someone who you think might have ACS, but then ends up being on the lower lower side. Maybe not like acute uh, need for a cath. Um, and of course, in a cath, if you find multi-vessel disease, aka more than three coronary arteries are involved, or you have a left main disease with more than 75 stenosis as well as like other two vessel disease, then you obviously need to consider cabbage, which is a coronary artery bypass graft because the stenting open multiple vessels is just not ideal. And usually at that point, you need to um, consult cardiac surgery. And that's the whole point why a cath is usually the dichotomy between those things to be able to physically visualize. So I know this was a lot. Um, ACS is a very tough topic, especially um, to kind of grapple uh, when you're first starting into year, but hopefully this kind of makes it a bit easier. I think the biggest things to remember are the three categories of ACS and then ultimately how you kind of manage them acutely early on and then how you run a risk stratify them with a score like the Timmy score. So if you enjoyed this video, please drop a like, comment, share, and subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next one. Peace.